Okay, so this is my Akai GXR6 auto reverse tape deck. This is sort of my workhorse tape deck. Um, I've actually already serviced this deck about a year ago, but it's been having a little bit of trouble in the transport still. It actually never has quite worked right. Sometimes it uh, doesn't auto reverse all the way, which is annoying when it's uh, set up to automatically reverse itself. It gets stuck and I have to manually intervene. The whole point of an auto reverse deck is convenience, so I want to get that working. It's not the best sounding deck, it's more of a consumer grade deck I would say. It does have the Super GX head, which Akai is uh, famous for, but um, because it's auto reverse, it doesn't always hold the head azimuth quite as well, and the electronics in here are much more typical consumer grade type electronics. So anyway, let's uh, take it apart and see what the problem is. So I've taken the screws out of the cover. There's one strange thing about this cover is the back panel is uh, like a fiberboard type panel and the screws are actually on the outside of the fiberboard and screw into the top which is a little unusual so when you're putting it back together make sure that you're screwing the screws on the right side. So here's the inside of the GXR6 or my GXR6 anyway. Here's your uh, tape transport, uh, power supply board, this is the main PCB, this is the power transformer, this little guy is a strap-on transformer that I added. This is a Japanese deck, so it takes 100 volts at 60 hertz, not 120 like I have here in the States. So this is a little buck transformer that takes uh, 20 volts down from the mains, so I didn't have to swap out the entire transformer. So this is the back of the transport. Uh, I put all new belts in it last year, so it's a uh, pretty good shape that way. These are the ribbon cables for uh, the switches for sensing the various uh, type types and the state of the eject door and also motor control, cam wheel position. And this guy down here is the power supply. This transport has two motors. There's the main motor that drives the two cap stands as well as the take up reels. This is the belt for the take up reels and this is the cap stand belt here. This motor drives the cam wheels. There's a, a shuttered wheel here and two sensors. That's how it determines how many steps it's moved. Uh, this belt is very easy to replace. You don't even have to take anything apart. So if you have an issue with the take up reels, you can replace this belt. However, there is another belt on the other side and that's usually the one that has the problem, which I'll get to later. Uh, to, to replace the cam wheel belt. It is also possible to do it without taking anything apart, though it's a bit tricky. And obviously the capstan belt, you have to take it apart. So the first thing that needs to happen is we need to take the front panel off here. Got these screws. Standard Phillips heads. Always put my screws in a little cup of some sort, and I use different cups for different things, so I know which screws came from what. door off, get that out of the way so I don't damage it. It's just the front panel just slides right off. So you can probably see the uh, UV damage on the buttons here. I was thinking about retrobriting them but a couple of the buttons that also need retrobriting are molded into the front panel and I didn't want to try to take them off. So the transport's held on by two screws on the top here. And four screws on the bottom. There's also a little shield here that protects the cables going to the heads. There's a screw right there and a little ground strap with a capacitor on it, so watch out for that. Just be careful not to break the lead to the capacitor. I'm actually putting the screw back in so that I don't stress out the cap and also keep track of which screw is for what. 
Okay, so getting this transport out of here is not too difficult. It actually can come out. First thing I do is remove the power button uh, arm here. So you're going to have to move this board out of the way. So. There's three screws that hold the power supply board in place. These are machine screws, in case you're losing track of which screws go where. The other screws are all self-tapping screws. So I just kind of pull it out of the way, flip it over. Make sure your deck's unplugged at this point, goes without saying. Uh, these ribbon cables snap out, you just pop the little doors open. And just kind of jiggle them out. Sometimes they get hung up, it's just to kind of be gentle. Don't rip them out. Kind of move them back and forth. And number three. Okay, to disconnect the audio cables, you need to cut this little wire tie here. Unplug the cable from the board. You got to be careful not to break the wires out of the back of the connector. So if the being stubborn, use a tool. Also, keep track of which one is where. So, always take pictures before you get started. I should have mentioned that at the beginning of the video. I know I've mentioned that in some of my other videos. Take pictures before you take out any screws. Take pictures of which cable goes where. So, for example, this is a blue strap and this is a yellow strap. I've got this video to look back on but you won't so take pictures before you start disassembling so you don't have questions later. You'll be much happier trust me. So that's the playback and record head cables. There's also an erase head cable. Not all tape decks have connectors for everything to the transport. This one does really just for ease of assembly but uh, in the factory but it also helps for servicing alright so now you can just push the transport back and lift it right up okay so here's your transport there's your heads there's your two pinch rollers and the cap stands are up there this little mechanism here is what flips the heads back and forth when it auto reverses this is what failed originally on my deck. This pin right here fell out and the pin here also disappeared. I never found it. I had to make my own out of this little torque screw from a phone because this little spring right there is what makes it snap back and forth. So when this pin fell out, the whole this little rack fell out. It's just like a rack and pinion system. See it slides back and forth. So one of the big criticisms of this type of auto reverse system where the head flips is that losing the head azimuth, the alignment, so these two screws here are the stops for where the head stops when it snaps into position. And because it's smacking back and forth, over time it slowly wears and loses its alignment. But in all honesty, this deck holds its alignment pretty well. So uh, maybe because it's all metal, a lot of the later cassette decks used much more plastic in their transports. So things just do not hold their alignment as the plastic warps and changes shape and dries and ages. So what moves the head are these little arms here. There's one there and there's one there. These little rubber feet come off very easily, so be careful. Sometimes they yeah, this one's split a little bit. I'll probably use a little bit of adhesive to hold that on. There's a micro switch, leaf switch, sorry, right here. That's how the deck knows that the uh, heads have flipped completely. So here's another view of the back of the transport. It's a little circuit board where all the harnesses from all the various switches and motors and sensors come together to get routed to the uh, logic board on the main uh, main electronics. There's the 
capstan flywheels and pulleys. Uh, be careful with this little flex cable here. This is pretty fragile. This is sort of early in the flex cable days, I think. It's glued on that end and on that end. But if you damage that, you're in trouble. So that's what gives the uh, provides the flexibility to have the head flipping back and forth like that without breaking the wires. One thing about this is that they use a Molly lube here, and it's very important to use a Molly lube. This deck, this transport is a good example of having to use the correct lubricants in the correct place because it really depends on the sort of uh, conservation of momentum of smacking that slider over and having it snap into position. The electronics quickly give up. If it's slow in movement, it just gives up and you have to press the button again and then it'll eventually kick it over, but it's important to have everything moving smoothly. So I have this part moving nice and smoothly, but it still doesn't auto-reverse very well. This slider is kicked by these two arms and those are driven by two cam wheels inside. And when I first took this apart, I did not go all the way down to the cam wheels because it didn't seem necessary. But now I think I should go all the way down and replace the lubricant in there because the other greases on here were pretty dried up. Even the Molly Lube was pretty dried up. This slider here is actually um, aluminum, it seems like, not plastic. So uh, you got a metal on metal here, which is one of the reasons to use a Molly type lube. There's also, a, it's a high load, so the Molly Lube helps with those situations. Start taking this apart. Start with the back panel here. Okay, there's a tricky part here. The chassis of the transport loops around behind the belt for the cam gear, and it's a little tricky to get that unhooked, especially when you're putting it back together. Be careful not to pinch this belt in between here before you start torquing down the screws. So now's the time to take off the belt for the take-up reels and the capstan. So as you can see there's a lot of wires in between here and here. I did not desolder any of these wires the last time I worked on it, but you got to be careful because if you move them around too much, you can break the solder joints. Luckily, this one wraps around the circuit board here, which helps with strain relief, and it wraps around on this side as well. So I didn't have any issues. I did undo this little tie back here. I think this was a zip tie before. I just used a twist tie so I could take it apart again easily. So I had a feeling I'd be back in here. So there's a lot to juggle. You've got this little cable here for, for a micro switch on this side. You've got all these cables here. And you've got these cables wrapping around and going to the front. And then you got this ribbon cable here. So these cap stands normally they're held on many tape decks by just these plastic bumpers and they just kind of touch it right there and keep the pulley in position. On this deck there are some things attached to the other side of these cap stands that are actually holding it in place. Now I could pull it up and it would pop those off but I want to show you what those look like. There's an oil stopper and there's a rubber roller on it. Just some of the design compromises of this deck. So I think my problem has to do with this area right here. There was a molly lube on here before. It was all dried up. This wasn't moving all that great. And I replaced the molly lube with this, which is a Crytox lubricant, which is a very good lubricant, but this particular version of Crytox has a very high viscosity. And although it's making, although the mechanism is smooth, it's also dampening its movement too much, and I think that might be part of the problem. But also, I think I need to lubricate the actual cam wheel itself, which I did not do last time, because I didn't want to dig any further into this, but uh, this time I'm going to have to go all the way, I think. So you push up on these little tabs. 
on either side of here and this panel comes off easily that exposes the front of the transport here now many transports have lose the ability to fast forward and rewind due to a idler wheel that's here that kicks back and forth and moves the take up reels and that idler wheel gets hard and loses its grip, its traction and that's often the cause of the problem. Now on this deck it, it suffers from the same issue but that's for a different reason. There is a tiny belt right there. This is, this is what moves back and forth to switch between fast forward and rewind. It's a gear but it's a belt driven gear and the belt kit I got from Mars Communications did not have this belt in it so I had to go and source it myself. I'll put up on the screen the exact dimensions of the belt that I found. It does have two idlers though, one there and there, and these do drive the take-up reels but they're only used for playback and this one engages during forward playback and this one on reverse playback. The design compromise I was referring to earlier was that it drives these take-up reels with the capstan motor right off the end of the capstan here so any vibration or slipping of this idler gets transferred right into the gap stand, which is what's regulating your tape speed. And that shows up as uh, flutter. So it's important to make sure that these idlers are gripping well and not uh, skidding or doing anything strange that will mess up your playback sound. You'll hear it when you're playing back tone tapes if it's doing it. It's pretty obvious. I'm going to remove the eject door now. Get out of the way. I'm going to do it with this side. This other side has a bunch of other stuff strapped to it. Wires. So that's that. Set that aside. Watch out so the spring doesn't fly away. And there's the door. So now you can see a better view of the inside of the transport. There's the head motion up and down here. There's a small spring right here, a leaf spring that puts pressure right here to try to hold this in alignment to maintain the head alignment. So swing this little board out of the way. This just holds the light bulb for to illuminate the uh, back of the tape. Now you can see that little belt a little better. It just wraps around this gear. On, there's a pulley behind there and it attaches to this little aluminum pulley here. I'm going to have to remove this pulley to get the big end of it out so I can take, take it apart. There's Loctite on that set screw so you need a good screwdriver to crack it loose. So this is the pulley. This is uh, the clutch that's supposed to slip when it hits the end of the tape. But more often the belt ends up slipping. There's a little thrust washer down in there uh, when you pull that pulley off. So keep an eye out for that. Don't lose it. It's plastic. This is the little panel that contains all the micro switches to detect the tape type and the rate protect on the tape sides. There's one for each side for the rate protect and then metal and chrome. So to get the cap stands out we have to take out the uh, little rubber roller I was talking about as well as the oil stop. So the first time you do this the rubber rollers tend to really stick to the cap stand so it helps to very gingerly pry it out. I've had this apart before so this should come out. There they come. So I'm just pulling the pulley out from the back and just carefully being ready to grab the roller when it falls out. And then there's the oil stopper. It's two plastic washers and a felt washer in between. It's just to keep that roller dry of the uh, capstan oil. So there's the oil stopper rings. And 
caps down. To keep everything straight, I'm going to set these in here. Set them aside. This is an idler for the capstan belt. This can make some funky noises. Um, if your deck makes weird grumbling or squeaky noises while it's just sitting there idling, maybe this guy just needs a little lube. So these are the two two of the arms that follow the grooves on the uh, can gear. Now taking this apart, if you're going to pull the can gears out, definitely need the service manual because it tells you how to rekey them. Here's the other arms here. These, these are the arms that actually kick the heads over. So these are the ones I'm particularly interested in. Alright, going down the next layer here. I haven't taken this apart this far before. These are all self-tapping screws because we're screwing in the plastic here. There's one machine screw right on the side here. Okay, I'm going to have to remove these little springs here. There's two tiny springs wrapping around the capstan bushings. This little hook here hooks into this loop on the frame right there. And there are the cam wheels. Now, that looks like a molly lube to me. So I'm going to clean those up, clean all the old grease out, and replace it with some new, fresh, silicon-based molly lube. So here are the cam wheels. This is what drives all the various levers and sliders that move the heads and the pinch rollers and the auto reverse mechanism. It's very important to keep them in registration with each other. There's two marks right there and there and if you have to line them up like so. So if you pull these gears out make sure you line them up together. Now the service manual also explains where the various levers engage with these cam wheels. So here you can see the back side, or rather the front side of the levers that move various sliders back and forth. There's the auto reverse. Here are the two rubber pads that kick the auto reverse slider over. Don't want to lose those. Mine are getting a little dry and split, so I'm probably going to glue them back on with a little silicone adhesive or possibly some rubber cement. So these wheels move fairly freely. They're a little they bind up a little bit. So I can see that there's a Molly lube that they used. It's a bit dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean all these out. I just use some Q tips. Clean the old grease out. You can also add some uh, alcohol to help cut through the grease. Careful with these little tabs here. These uh, don't push down on them too hard, or they can break. And there's the back of the cam wheel. It also has little pins that ride through these guides. So when you're putting it back together, it's really important to look at the uh, manual. Make sure you've got the right pin going on the right guide, because sometimes some of them can actually get into the wrong guide when you put it together and then it kind of messes up the works. The service manual does a pretty good job of explaining uh, what the various modes do, what the various arms do, how they operate, and has some nice diagrams that show the relationship between the pins and the various grooves that they ride, th ride through. It does not mention the type of lubricant to use here but it's very obviously a molly lube. Alright, let's regrease this thing I'm using this uh, silicone based molly lube. Just going to apply it with the end of a cut off end of a cotton swab here just to make it a little more precise. Just going to twirl it in there and then apply it. So if you get confused about which way is up on these, 
just look for that registration mark I talked about right there and right there it should be up facing you when looking down on the plastic part of the chassis and they'll be engaged just like that okay so from my perspective here this is actually the top of the transport black is on the left whites on the right if I had it the other way around it would be reversed obviously so now we got to put them back on there but we got to make sure that these pins are in the correct guide for this position okay so here's the transport right side up these two pins down here are the play arms they're the ones that drive the play heads up these pins right here close to the shaft drive the pinch rollers the more important places to lubricate are where the grooves change position so when they're just going in a concentric circle there's usually not much force it's when they're actually stepping up or down that's when there's going to be motion on the arms and that's kind of where the most uh, friction occurs so according to the service manual the for this white wheel the capstan pin should be close to the shaft here riding in this inner groove and this play arm as they call it which drives the playhead should be on this outer groove up here and I think that's what I heard click when I pulled this out that looks good so line it up right there feels nice and smooth now not dry and creaky like it was before and again the pinch roller one goes on this inner groove here and the play playhead goes playhead arm goes on this outer groove here all right Let's take your first spin here definitely want to make sure you got this right because if you mess it up you have to take it all apart again there's one direction see the playheads going up Clean your hands. That Molly Lube is tenacious stuff. All right, now we got to line up the pins on this side. I'm going to relubricate these sliders with the right kind of lubricant. I'm using a little denatured alcohol here. Since I'm switching lubricants. Little bumps on here, three little bumps on this side. That's where it actually hits the metal. Don't go too crazy with the grease so you'll end up with a mess. Okay, so the way to realign these arms with the cam wheels, these inner guys here, the ones that actually kick the auto reverse mechanism, they go inwards. They ride on the innermost grooves here. And then these guys ride on this sort of outer, nearly outer groove. And yeah, this one should sit in this. This open area right here. And then the black one is supposed to sit in this open area right here. And then you gotta align this these sliders on the pin here, plastic pin. Okay, so there's a little hole here, so you can see your registration marks. You can make sure that you've got them perfectly aligned and that you've got this arm in this parking spot here 
and you can kind of see there's an open area between two slots in the cam wheel. This one's in that parking area there. And then this pin here comes through this hole. Okay, so let's put the screws back in to the uh, plate here. This one goes through that little loop that holds the wires in place. These help hold the wires away from the uh, flywheels. Okay, I'm going to clean the Molly Lube off. Cap stands here. A little, a little alcohol. Yeah, these little springs are just um, they're little ground straps to ground the cap stands because they're insulated otherwise. Okay, I'm going to show how I service the idler tires on tape decks like this. Um, I already did this a year ago, so I'm just going to show how I do it since I have it all apart. You pop off these little plastic rings on this type. Sometimes they use uh, Eclipse. These have these annoying plastic rings that are a pain to get off. I usually just use my fingernails rather than tools so they don't get chewed up. I already popped it off this one. So usually what you'll find is a very polished surface that has um, possibly very small cracks if you look really really close. If you see deep cracks then there's not much you can do. The, the rubber is gone and you'll have to find a replacement idler tire. These are an unusual size. I don't know if they cross over to any other decks unlike the uh, GX7 which has I believe the same idler tire as Nakamichi. So the first thing I'll do is I'll try to see if I can get it off the hub. If it feels really stiff, there's a danger of possibly splitting it or causing um, a crack to creep even deeper. So I'll use uh, some rubber renew on it first. Soak it on there really good. I always wear gloves when I handle this stuff. Just use a cotton swab and just wipe it on there across it and just go around a bunch of times and let it air dry. Rubber Renew is toxic. The fumes give me a headache if I don't use them in a well-ventilated area, so be careful with this stuff. That's why I'm wearing gloves. Um, it's basically a strong solvent. Xylene or turpentine. It smells like xylene to me. And I believe an evergreen oil, some sort of oil. The xylene causes the rubber to expand and it carries the oil inside and then the xylene evaporates and it leaves the oil behind and it's the intention is to replace the oils that have gone missing in the rubber since it was made. So once I let it soak and it feels like it's more pliable I'll remove it from the hub. Often I'll give it even more rubber renew treatment just to soften it even more if it feels really hard. I'll put a small amount in a little cup like this one and just let it soak in there for a few minutes and it'll really penetrate it in there and it'll also make the rubber swell so don't be alarmed uh, your belt or whatever you're doing this to will get bigger temporarily but if you let it dry and let it sit overnight usually isn't long enough for it to shrink back down to the correct size sometimes I let it sit for 48 hours and that no harm seems to come to it by doing that and then the next thing you need to do for an idler wheel is remove the hard surface. So the, if the rubber, the rubber should feel nice and flexible now. If it doesn't, then you should think about replacing it still. And then what I do is take a piece of 100 grit sandpaper and just rub the wheel evenly and smoothly. You don't want to make any flat spots, especially on these because of their proximity to the capstan. And after sanding, you want to clean it off because there's like rubber sanding dust left in there. And you can use, I'll just use the rubber renew to clean it off since it's got a nice powerful solvent. That usually does the trick. Gotta let this stuff dry. It usually dries pretty quick unless you give it the soaking treatment like I said. So if you do the idler restoration and you find it's still not gripping well enough for you and buying a new idler tire is not an option for you, 
you, there's one more thing you can try to do. It's sort of a temporary fix, but it does work really well. It's this stuff, belt dressing. You'll find it at your automotive store. It's meant to spray on rubber belts to keep them from squealing. It does not really work on rubber belts, just so you know. Uh, it lasts for maybe an hour, and then it just dries up and the belt starts squealing again. But in a low-stress situation like this, this stuff actually lasts for a while. Eventually it will dry up and the tire will start slipping again, but it does give you, it will buy you some time. If you do use this stuff, spray it on the end of a cotton swab and then apply it. Don't spray it on your tape deck, all right? Even though it's got the straw, just, just don't. It's a sticky, gooey mess. To put these little plastic rings back on, just use your finger. Make your finger a little wet to help it stick to the end of your finger if you're worried about dropping it. Works better than any other tool I've used. So next is the pulley for the uh, wind assembly, the take-up reels. There's two washers, plastic washers, thrust washers. One goes on this end. Since it's a bronze bushing and a steel shaft, a little bit of uh, just a couple drops of little sewing machine oil. I use this synthetic stuff. And the other washer. And then the aluminum pulley. Make sure this freewheels nicely. Don't make it too tight. Make sure you get that set screw good and tight. Don't want that to come off. And get the belt back on. Make sure the belt's not twisted. Put the cap sands on next. I'm going to lube it. With a little bit of that sewing machine oil, just a few drops. And we put all these, <coughs> put the oil stopper back on there. It's a plastic washer. A felt pad and another plastic washer. And then the rubber roller. You can see the wear mark of where it was uh, up against the idler. It should be towards you. Make sure the cap stand spins freely so you don't want to push that on too hard. The other one. Remember to clean the cap sends off when you're done because there's always a little bit of oil that gets on there. Now put the side back on here and watch out for this little wire. Don't get it caught in there. Of course we have to put the door on too. I'm just going to get some of the screws started. Pull your little plunger out. Test it. It should go in easy and then it should give you resistance pulling it out. If you're the type of person who defines the quality of your tape deck by how slowly the eject door opens, then you can try to treat the uh, plunger or dampener that controls the door speed. Now, you might be tempted to pack it with a bunch of heavy grease. That doesn't work. It almost never works. And there's a reason for that. edit here. If you're going to do it this way, be careful. The flex cable for the heads is right here. Don't want to stress that out. So just pull the plunger out like that. 
So on the end of the uh, piston here, there's a little seal. Now some, on some decks I've seen this just a simple O-ring. And if that's the case, then sometimes use, packing it with a heavy grease can help. But usually you need that friction of the rubber against the walls of the cylinder to give you that dampening that you need. This one has a little, it's like a little flap. And when you push it in, it gets pushed down. And then when it comes out, the flap opens and it's supposed to drag against the cylinder to slow it down. But this one's old and the rubber is squished down and it just does not grab the walls like it should. You can replace this dampener, the entire assembly, but finding a replacement seal like this, I've never had any luck finding them. But you can pull these off. And in this case, I found that uh, there's a standard metric O-ring that fits over it. This doesn't have the same effect that this has, but it's a slightly larger diameter and it creates the friction that you need. Now, the downside of this is that when you push the piston in, when you close the door, it's also going to dampen that movement, which the old one did not. So it's up to you whether you want to put up with that or not. If this is really important to you, how slow the door opens, then you can try this fix and see if it works. It's worth a shot. Just keep the old one in case it doesn't. So in this case the shaft is rounded on one side and flat on the other. The flat side goes towards the transport. So this is nice and slow and stiff now. There's a screw at the back here that also is supposed to adjust the rate. But what I usually find is if I try to screw this screw in, it'll split the plastic cylinder and just make the problem worse. So I usually don't bother with it and it usually doesn't work anyway. This end goes there, that end will go there. Make sure the bottom is where it's supposed to be. Gently lift this back around. Again, be careful of that flex cable to the heads. There's three screws on this side, two self-tapping screws that go into the plastic and one machine screw that goes over here that I took out earlier and forgot about. The spring actually goes on the other side of this. And this side of the spring actually holds that on there. Let's see how it works. Oh yeah. That's the stuff right there. Okay, we've got to put the capstan belt back on. Be sure and clean your hands when you're handling belts, otherwise you'll uh, get transfer oil onto them or grease. So it wraps around the idler like this across the, the back of this pulley in between them and around the other side and the motor grabs it right there. Now I'll put this guy back on the back back on the transport here. Again we gotta watch for this little bracket not pinching the belt. Hop it along. Capstan belt up on the uh, motor here. Okay, now is the time to make sure you've got everything on the right side of everything. So these wires over here that are currently behind this bracket don't belong there. They need to be on the outside. Take another close look. Make sure there's nothing getting pinched. Nothing dragging on the pulleys. Make sure that it seats fully down. There's a, a brass standoff on this side that helps you center the plate and snaps in there and then just make sure it sits up against this bracket without having to push down. If something's springing it, there's something getting pinched and you need to figure out what. So I always just put the screws in loosely. Just kind of holds everything in position. Take a close look. Put on the belt for the take-up rails. running around make sure the uh, capstan belt is centered it should self-center I got this little sensor arm okay got the little sensor arm back on there I make sure that the levers are on top of the leaf switches just a note 
would have been easier to put this on before putting this and the uh, pulley on. But you can pop these guys out if you uh, forget. Alright, so I'm looking in my cup of parts here and all I have left are the two little pads for the auto reverse and the uh, sleeve for the piston. Just going to use a little glob of rubber cement to hold these pads on since they're dried up and don't want to stay. So these little wires here are a little tricky. They just sort of float above all this other stuff. Which is why I used that little wire tie to kind of bundle them all together. They had a zip tie here before. Something tells me this is not the last time I'm going to take this apart. So Call it instinct. Alright, transport. Done. Alright, so let's put this guy back in here. See if it works. When reconnecting these little ribbon cables, there's usually a side that's got a tracer on it. This has got a yellow stripe. And these connectors, there's a bump on the side where the tracer is supposed to go. Make sure the wires go into all the holes. Don't cross any wires or leave any out. Take a second to straighten them out before you do it. There we go. I'm not going to put the screws in the transport yet. Everything is wired up. Let's see how we did. It's a good sign. Motor's running. It's forward play. reverse and it's flipping back forward because this is the wheel that it uses to sense the tape stopping so even though this wheel has a shutter on it there's only one sensor it's on this side and you can tell that your idler wheel is providing enough traction by grabbing the take up reel and seeing if this inner hub is still spinning. If it slips on the it slips on the idler wheel, then you know that's the problem. Alright, so even though I calibrated this deck about last year, I'm gonna go ahead and just run through everything really fast. I'm gonna check the tape speed first. It's a three kilohertz tone. 3.008 is pretty good. So normally on this deck, on many tape decks the speed control is, or the adjustment rather, is right in the back of the motor. Some other decks have it on a circuit board elsewhere. You just have to look at your service manual. You try to want to use a uh, non-metallic adjustment for the ones that are inside the motor because the screwdriver, if you use just a regular small screwdriver, the inserting the steel shaft in there will actually change the motor speed so you have to go in make the adjustment pull it out check it if you use a plastic one it doesn't do that so normally I would check the transport uh, alignment with a mirror cassette like this one it lets you see where the tape is threading through the mechanism unfortunately the door on this deck perfectly covers this window so I can't use this I'll right, we'll check the alignment now the other direction. Turn with my other 10 kilohertz tape. Just going to double check. Yeah, it's pretty much right on. Okay, so the head azimuth was correct, the tape speed was correct. I'm just going to double check the playback level. This is checking the playback amplifier inside the tape deck. There is a procedure in the service manual that talks about using certain cassette tapes and looking for certain levels of output on the jacks. 
but there's a much easier way when the deck has Dolby. You All you need to do is use one of these Dolby cassettes. These cassettes are recorded with a very specific magnetic flux level on them and they output the maximum level that the Dolby chip can handle when doing Dolby encoding. And if you look at the data sheet for your Dolby chip on your tape deck, you will usually find where they specify what that level should be. And they'll show a test point on an example schematic and a voltage level and tell you exactly how much voltage you will see on which pin. So this tape deck uses the very common 652 Dolby chip for the encode decode and it uses the 654 for the audio routing that allows them to use the same chip for record and playback among other things. The schematic in the datasheet shows where the test point is. There's test point 1. It's on pin 18 of the 654 chip and then it shows you that there, I should find 387.5 millivolts which is 0 dB at that pin. Now most tape decks have a Dolby symbol on the meters. This one has it at plus 3 dB. That is the maximum level you should record at when using Dolby. If you exceed that level then the Dolby encode will function the way it's supposed to. So what we do is we play back this tape which is re already recorded at the maximum level. We look for a 3 to 7.5 on pin 18 and then we can also adjust the meter level and set them to be just on the Dolby symbol and then we'll have a calibrated playback amplifier and a calibrated set of meters which we can then use later to set up the record amplifier. And the meters is just kissing plus 3 dB Okay, so I've gone back and forth several times with the recording, or sorry, the playback equalization, the playback gain, and using the 10 kilohertz tape, the multi-tone tape, just trying to get the best average correct setting. With an auto reverse deck, when you flip the tape, you it's often you can't you end up with a different result, so you just kind of have to split the difference between the two. Alright, so I'm setting the record bias for uh, normal tape here. I don't ever intend to record with this deck, but I'm just going to set it anyway in the off chance that I do. It's one of the things about this deck that makes it kind of a pain for recording is the record level is digital. It's not an analog knob, it's a couple buttons here and it just selects different steps. And there just really aren't enough steps to set it right, and you can't adjust the balance either. So it's really not a great deck for recording, but it's fine for playback, and it's the convenience of auto reverse is there. Yeah, it's pretty close. Try chrome tape. So that was uh, Maxell normal tape. These are the tapes I like to use for normal bias adjustments on fixed bias decks like this one. This is the chrome tapes I like to use. Maxell XL2. It's good. One for metal, Max LMX for me. These decks are calibrated for TDK from the factory. Metal's a little hot too. It's better. Alright, close enough. Okay, I'm setting the record level now. We feed a minus 5.5 dB signal in and play it back and try to get it to the same level. It's one kilohertz.
Looks good. Check the bias filter real quick here. Yeah, it's quiet. So the bias filter, you feed no input, check the output, set the record to maximum volume, and try to get the output down to minimum, but I'm getting nothing. Uh, just noise, the background noise of the deck, so. So the next step is meter sensitivity. You can check this. Uh, it's already set from using the Dolby cassette, but you can double check it by feeding in a one kilohertz signal. And they say to look for uh, minus 5.2 dBm on the output. You adjust the record level until you get that level from the output. And then you adjust the meter so that plus one dB just extinguishes on the meter. And the MPX filter, <laughs> not gonna be recording off the radio, so don't need that. So that concludes the adjustment of this tape deck. I've been uh, flipping the heads back and forth and they're kicking over just fine now. Uh, it's looking pretty good. So calling this one done. All right, let's put the front panel back on here. Careful. Be gentle with your old 80s plastic. Let's get all the screws in before you tighten them down. Now just push the panel in as I'm tightening. Don't over tighten these because you'll split the plastic. I push it in as I'm tightening to make sure these buttons reach the actual switches on the board. All right, let's give it one last check. Okay, the Akai GX R6 is all put back together and everything is working fine. Let's check our tape deck quality detector. Oh yeah, that's a quality tape deck right there. And this concludes my Akai GX R6 servicing video. I hope something in there was useful. And thank you for watching.